next presenter is Joaquin Lopez. I think after seven editions, the only speaker that has been seven times presenting here is Joaquin. So thank you, Joaquin, for being here again. And also thank you for your work this year in, in Boost, uh, trying to provide new solutions on containers and trying to make them faster. So, well, I'm very interested. Okay, thank you for having me. Uh, okay, can you hear me well? I I like to like uh, walk around the stage, but uh, we have a problem with uh, with the mic, so I will try to stay behind the lectern as much as possible. But I tend to like uh, go away, etc. So tell me if you are not hearing me well, okay? So I would like to explore with you an FD new hash map we have developed in Boost. The name is Boost on Order Flat Map. This container uh, uses some state of the art technology, not invented by us but it also introduces some new notions, some new innovations that I think you may find it interesting to, to, interesting to, to learn about. So it is not a mere rehash of the existing technology, okay? First of all, let me say that I am extremely happy to be back in using STD CPP after four unbearably long years. I hope you have made it reasonably well through the COVID pandemic, and my sympathies go to those of you who have had a rough time or personal losses, etc. So, uh, there's a cliche saying that goes like, uh, everyone should during their lifetime um, write a book, plant a tree, and have a child. If we translate this to the world of C++ development, we could say a little tongue-in-cheek that every C++ developer worth the result should uh, make at least one contribution to the standard, write a ray tracer, and design and implement a hash table. Uh, please raise your hand, those of you who have made at least one of these three things. Okay, two things. Okay, and the three of them. No? Okay, so you have homework to do, okay? Uh, I have not done the, the three things. Either. Okay, so one of the reasons that there are so many uh, hash maps around is that the one provided by the standard library is infamously slow. The reason it is so slow is because it was designed in 2004. Back at that time, closed addressing, which is the technique implicitly assumed to be used by student on ordered map, was deemed uh, robust enough and fast enough. This is not the case 20 years after. The problem with the API of student ordered map is that it so heavily relies on the assumption that closed addressing is used that you cannot basically implement a student ordered map with anything other than uh, closed addressing. But then open addressing have made significant uh, progresses in terms of getting more performance and currently it is very easy to be depends off STD on ordered map anytime. So, in Boost, we decided to do anything about that. Uh, a year ago, Boost on Audit was basically providing a fully compliant <coughs> implementation of Stud on Audit Map. We decided to somehow extend our offer in order to continue providing that container, but also embrace open addressing techniques and try to come up with something which is faster for our users at the exchange of deviating a little bit from the standard. Okay, we will learn later on during the conversation what compromises we had to make uh, in order to, to provide this container. So uh, in March 2022, the development plan for Boost on Order was written. We began by improving on the existing Boost on Order map. We are not going to be talking too much about this uh, container. Then in December 2022, we uh, released Boost on Order flat map, which is the open addressing container we are going to be talking about mostly during this talk. A couple of weeks ago, we released a Boost on Order node map, which is like a variation of an ordered flat map providing pointer stability in exchange for decreased performance. And if things go well, and they are going very well internally from what I can see, uh, we're going to be releasing a beast called Concurrent Flat Map in August 2023. I am tremendously excited about this. 
little beast, we will have a teaser about it. But the, the main focus of the, of the talk today is boost another flat map. I am by no means the only person involved in this effort. There are a lot of folks uh, helping uh, carry on with this uh, development plan for Boost and Order. The main, the officially appointed main maintainer of Boost and Order is Christian Mazakas. Peter Dimov has made key contributions to the library, particularly in the area of hash functions and hash post mixing. Sam Darwin is our uh, IT dev DevOps CI wizard. Thanks to him, we have been able to test and benchmark our containers in a vast array of different compilers and platforms. And Martin and Pavel have uh, contributed a lot of feedback and uh, tested the early versions of the, of the library. So thank you to all of them. And uh, you can only put that many pictures in one slide. There are many more uh, folks hanging out in this Boost and Order uh, Slack group. This is open and public, so everyone is welcome to join in if you're interested in having a say about how to move things forward with Boost and Order. Also, let me mention that this work is um, funded by the C++ Alliance, which is a nonprofit organization devoted to the betterment of C++ in general and Boost in particular. There's the URL for the website if you're interested in having a look at it. So let's dive in. A hash table is basically, the business of a hash table is basically to insert a bunch of elements into a so-called bucket array. We are doing this by means of a hash function. The hash function ideally maps a diff each different element to a different hash value. Typically, you are not going to get like 100% success rate, but if the hash function is good enough, probabilistically speaking, hash values are going to be different. Hash values are typically large, like 64 bits. So in order to fit all these pays into the bucket array, which is much uh, uh, smaller, you have to do some kind of reduction of the hash value, like uh, via some modular function or keeping the lower bits of the hash, etc. So this is all known to you, basically. The problem, the basic problem of a hash table is what happens if two different elements are mapped into the same bucket? either because the hash function has like failed and has produced the same hash value, or because the narrowing process basically makes the two hash values end up in the same bucket, okay? This is called a collision, and you are all hopefully familiar with what a collision in a hash table is, okay? The main the difference between closed addressing and open addressing is what we do with collisions. In the case of open addressing, we are maintaining a length list of nodes for each bucket, okay? So handling a collision is a very, very simple task. If uh, an element happens to be mapped into a bucket which already contains uh, another element, I just allocate a new node for it, I extend the list, and I'm done. So very easy, and that's one of the reasons that uh, I think it is very easy to implement this stuff. What happens with open addressing? The defining characteristic of open addressing is that I can have at most one element in a bucket, which is called in this context also a slot. Okay, so slot and bucket, basically the same thing. So this has some benefits. We will, we will see what uh, those benefits are, but then the collision has to be solved some other way. Okay, if I'm mapping an element into a slot and the slot is already occupied, the only thing I can do is to try to locate an empty slot, okay? In this case, I'm just going to the next slot. The next slot happens to be void. I just use it, I'm done. So this is open addressing, and most of uh, the literature about open addressing is how to do this location of available slots. And what do I do when I remove elements? These are like the two key aspects of open addressing. Let's uh, consider this um, little experiment of what we call unsuccessful lookup. We are trying to locate an element in a hash table which is not there, okay? So in the case of open addressing, the one on, uh, on top, well, the, the, the beginning of a process is always the same. I 
obtain the hash value of this element, and then I locate the, the bucket or the slot for this element. And then, given that this element is not present in the, in the bucket array or the slot array, I have to go through all the different nodes associated to that bucket in order to determine that effectively none of them is the element I'm looking for, okay? Let's do a little calculation of the number of the average number of elements or nodes uh, inspected for closed addressing and open addressing, okay? We call this the average probe length. This is an important statistical figure of a hash table. We will be, be uh, going back to this APL thing a number of times during the talk, okay? So you can see that the APL, the average probe length for closed addressing is, in this particular case, 1.5. In the case of uh, closed addressing, I say, in the case of open addressing is actually higher. Why? Because you see that for one of the probes, the length can be as high as four. And this is because buckets or slots are interfering with each other. So if some bucket or some slot happens to be occupied and I'm doing some business in the slot next to it, then it will interfere in the sense that they will be part of a longer probe sequence, okay? This is something that uh, closed addressing does not suffer from because buckets do not interfere with each other at all. That means also that the hash function that uh, a closed addressing hash table has to use need not be as high quality as in the case of open addressing. This uh, effect with open addressing is called primarily, uh, primary clustering. And primary clustering is the main reason why your open addressing hash table won't work well, so you need to fight it, okay? These formulas are the average probe length for successful lookup and unsuccessful lookup. This was, uh, these were first derived by Donald Kenaf, I think, and uh, the, the only thing to notice here is that alpha is the load factor, is the number of elements divided by the number of slots. So in the case of the so-called linear probing, where you are basically going to the next slot and then the next one, et cetera, in order to find an available slot, for this case, the average probe length, both for successful and non-successful lookup, tends to infinity as the load factor tends to one. So the load factor is a very critical thing with open addressing tables, and you cannot possibly have a load factor as high as one in an open addressing table. Whereas in the case of uh, closed addressing, you can very easily set up a maximum load factor of one or even higher than that, okay? In order to minimize this problem, we can use some other probing techniques. So what you see on top is uh, linear probing, but we can also have quadratic probing, by which we are basically going to uh, slots in increasingly larger steps. The idea here is that if we happen to jump into the middle of a cluster, then by jumping by quadratic steps, we are able to get out of this cluster sooner and we are not contributing to the total length of a cluster. Do you get the idea? Okay. There are some other more sophisticated probing mechanisms like uh, double hashing, etc. but for, for the purposes of this talk, this is enough. Another problem with um, open addressing is what happens if I delete an element? So in the third slot, you see that I have deleted one element which was part of a probing sequence. You get that? Now, if I'm looking for the final element, my hash table is gonna fail because I jumped to the first one, then the, the other one, then the other one, and then I jumped into a, an empty slot. So the algorithm says, okay, the probe sequence has ended. There's no more elements to probe, okay? So this is, this won't go, okay? So this is really a problem. And we have like two or three ways to try to solve the deletion problem with open addressing. One, which is very, very uh, uh, known and very widely used is called tombstones. Tombstone is a special marker that I put in place of a deleted element in the slot. So when I'm looking for an element and I happen to jump into a tombstone, then I know that the probe sequence has to go on, okay? And then I can go to the next element and then the next one, and then after I have progressed towards a full probe sequence and I happen to jump into a really empty slot, the probe sequence is completed, okay? So these are tombstones. A problem with tombstones 
is that you already know that the average prop length of a hash table increases as the load factor increases, but with tombstones, the average prop length does not decrease. So the average prop length never decreases. So this leads to some uh, degradation in performance uh, for the hash table until the point where you have to rehash the table, for instance, okay? There are some other mechanisms, and boost another flat map is not using tombstones, it's using some other uh, stuff. Uh, there's also some more sophisticated algorithms that I have dubbed like relocating algorithms, in which you are basically leaving no empty slots in your probing sequence. This can be done at deletion time, like uh, in this example, and can also do, uh, be done at insertion times with the purposes of increasing or improving the performance of a hash table, like uh, trying to keep probe length as short as possible or the variance of a probe length as short as possible and this kind of stuff. <laughs> Uh, interrupt me at any time, by the way, because we are going to be like uh, going through a lot of stuff, and I I, I wouldn't want to uh, lose you in the middle of the talk. Okay, so if something's not clear, just raise your hand. Okay, so we we have like digested uh, a lot of information about closed addressing, open addressing. We are now in a position to somehow sketch a little taxonomy or a diagram of the different hash table algorithms that there are in in the market. Okay. On one hand, we have closed addressing. There's very little to say about that because it is as simple as it gets. And then we have open addressing with lots of variations. We have like uh, something that some, some people call hybrid approaches, which are not exactly open addressing, not exactly uh, closed addressing, like uh, coalesced hashing, very interesting uh, stuff, by the way. And then if we focus on pure open addressing hash tables, we can divide them or classify them into relocating, <coughs> algorithms and non-relocating algorithms. Relocating algorithms have some problems of their own. I wouldn't, that, I, I don't think they are so suitable for uh, general purpose standard like uh, C++ container, but I won't go into details anyway. There's like uh, three main uh, relocating algorithms in the literature called Cuckoo, Hashin, Hotshotch, and Robin Hood. If you go search in Wikipedia or whatever, you can find an explanation on them. And then for non-relocating algorithms, we have basically two techniques. Tombstones, we have already talked about that. And then we have something, this uh, I didn't find in the literature, so I just made up the term, <clears throat> what I call overflow-based algorithms, okay? We will learn about this, and actually boost on order flat map has uh, an overflow mechanism, not a tombstone mechanism. Any questions so far? Everyone with me? Okay, so you may think to yourself, well, you, you know the story already, but you may potentially think to yourself, okay, so what's so good about open addressing as opposed as compared to closed addressing? Because <laughs> closed addressing on one hand has pointer stability because nodes are allocated on nodes of their own. So if I have to rehash the table, pointers to the nodes do not get invalidated. This is not the case for open addressing. Closed addressing works with poor quality hash functions because I don't have primary clustering. And I, I, I can set the load factor as high as one or even higher than that. So open addressing is only worse in every respect. So what's, why uh, are we interested in open addressing? Yeah, exactly. Well, speed, performance. So we are, we, we are willing to sacrifice or make, accept the risk of working with these like unstable creatures because they are so faster, okay? So we are not allocating one node per element, so this means we have all one allocation. And open addressing uh, hash tables are, have very, very good hash locality, extremely good hash locality. Typically, you jump to the bucket that the, mash, uh, that the hash function told you to, to, to go to, and if you don't find the element there, it's going to be like in the vicinity. So cache locality is extremely good. Whereas in the case of closed addressing, you have to at least go through uh, two pointers, if not more than that. Okay. So how better uh, open addressing tables are as compared with closed addressing? So this is just an example. The green line is a boost on ordered map, which is not a slow container if you compare it with uh, standard implementations of a uh, standard node map. 
And the uh, blue line is boost another flat map. The containers are containers of insulins or something. It, it, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to show like the orders of magnitude we are talking about. So this plot is for successful lookup. <coughs> I need some water, sorry. The, um, this plot is for unsuccessful lookup. And this one is for insertion. So you are going to get typically like three to five better times, better performance with, uh, thank you very much. For, uh, for open addressing, <clears throat> as compared to closed addressing, this is why we are doing this. We want a speed, okay? And then there's a, a last element that we need to talk about when dealing with open addressing. And it is uh, same D. You all know what SIMD is, okay? I don't need to basically remind you. Okay. So there's this genius idea. I think uh, it was Google who came up first with that, that SIMD can be used to implement hash tables, okay? So let's say you have a bunch of elements and you are keeping a portion of the associated hash values in a so-called metadata array, like one byte per element like the lower bytes of a hash value or something like that, okay? And I'm trying, I'm looking for an element whose hash value, whose reduced hash value is B0, okay? Turns out that with SIMD operations, I can basically, with a handful of SIMD operations, I can create a 16-byte array of duplicated B0s and then compare in one fell swoop with the metadata array and obtain a mask of the matching elements, okay? If I have a positive match, that means that I have to go really double check the element in order to see, okay, is this the one? Or maybe I was unlucky because the reduced hash was the same. But if there's no match, then I'm totally certain that the element uh, is not there, okay? So what I am is uh, reducing or filtering out um, elements in a very, very efficient way. The number, this formula uh, is important to like uh, keep in mind or be a little familiar with. This is the number or the average of false positives you are gonna get with SIMD, op with SIMD match, okay? So the higher the load factor, the higher the number of false positives you are gonna get. The larger the group in the SIMD register, the larger, the higher the number of false positives, but then the number of false positives decreases exponentially with the size of the reduced hash you're using to do the comparison. So if your reduced hashes are like one byte, you get some, uh, some average false positive rate. If you had twice that much, then your false positive rate would be half the original figure. Got that? So we are now in a position to understand what or the layout or the basic approach of Boost on order uh, flat map. I love this picture. I put it for no particular reason. It's by Jean Cocteau. I, I, I really love it. Okay, so this is how Boost on order flat map looks when you look uh, under the hood, okay? The slot array is divided into two to, to the power of n groups of 15, not 16, 15 elements each, okay? And we have a metadata array where each group has a 16 byte word of metadata. 15 bytes of those are basically reduced hashes for the associated elements. And then we have a one byte overflow uh, bytes. Okay, we will understand or we will, uh, I will explain how the thing works. So far? Okay. So the reduced hash. It's not one byte because we need to reserve some values for special markers, like for signaling that the slot is empty or for a thing called a sentinel. I won't go into details about what a sentinel is. Okay, so I'm losing like two values out of, out of 256, but the rest, so when I'm not dealing with an empty slot or with a sentinel slot, I'm taking the rest of the value in order to get as much as possible of the hash value of the element that's in the associated slot. So that means that I'm storing 7.989 bits of information per element, okay? 
And uh, what's the deal with the overflow by? Uh, you saw in, uh, in an earlier slide that one way of determining that the probe has to end is because you'll find the, an empty slot. Another way is to have an overflow byte that signals for a particular group. Let's say I'm looking for a value with hash uh, value H. One way of determining whether I have to go past that group is to store that information in the overflow byte. I have eight bits in an overflow byte. That means that I can classify the reduced the hash values into eight classes, like take modulo eight, and I inspect the associated bit that will tell me whether for this hash I need to go further or the probe has to end. This is like a, maybe the trickiest part of a whole implementation. Are you with me? Do you understand it? Yes. Okay, good. So you're, you're very smart. It, it took me months to figure this out. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the general algorithm for lookup, okay? so. I got X, I calculate the hash value, I locate the group, okay? I do the CMD match thing with 15 elements using the reduced hash value, and then I obtain a mask. I go through the one to the bit set to one, and I do the comparison with the guys, and if I find the guy, I'm done. Otherwise, I go to the overflow byte, I determine whether the probe sequence has to end or not, if the probe sequence is, has to end because I'm not overflowed. Then the element is not there. Otherwise, I continue with the next group, which is uh, probed quadratically. But we are doing quadratic probe at the group level, not at the slot level. So 15 uh, elements at a time. Insertion is basically the same thing. Okay? And this is all. There, I know, there's another thing to know about, uh, sorry, just another flat map. Uh, you know that uh, we are very concerned about primary clustering, so we want to have a general purpose algorithm, uh, sorry, container, and we don't want uh, users to miserably fail using our containers because their hash function is lousy. So we are taking some measures in order to increase the quality of a hash function by doing a thing called post mixing, which in, in our case is basically doing the extended multiplication of the hash value by some magic constant related to the Fibonacci, the golden ratio uh, constant. And then this extended multiplication, which is 180 bit uh, uh, wide, we like do a folding about, uh, around it, and this is the value that we end up with. This is basically reducing the possibility that you have clustering in your hash table. So, it, the, the figure uh, on top is the distribution of bit probabilities for a very uh, poor ill-conditioned input set, like uh, integers going from 16 to 10 million or whatever. So you see that the space is basically empty and we only have variance across these very few bits. If we do the post-mixing thing, then we have this nice, like, everyone's equally likely, et cetera. Okay, so this is the post-mixing. We have, this is an opt-out mechanism. If your hash function is already good enough, you can basically uh, set up a trait and uh, instruct the container to not use post-mixing for maximum performance. 10 minutes. So how do we fare in terms of performance. So uh, let us compare us with Epsoil, Ep, Epsail, I don't know how to pronounce that, Epsail, let's say Epsail, flat hash map with is uh, generally regarded as one of the fastest uh, hash maps around. This is from Google, okay? Both containers are pretty similar, but there are some differences too. So the elements per group in our case is 15, they are doing 16 uh, elements uh, per group. Both are doing quadratic group level uh, probing. Hash mapping, in our case, is done at the group level. So we are locating a group, whereas they are locating slots, and then their groups are like sliding or moving, okay? Both are using CIMD technologies when available. The reduced hash, they are using some other um, encoding of the reduced hash value with a result that they are only using a payload of seven bits per reduced hash, whereas we have 7.989 bits, okay? And they are doing the prop termination thing by, via empty, by uh, tombstones uh, and empty slots, whereas we have these overflow by, okay? So the distribution of elements across uh, 
boost hash table and absent hash table is quite different because they are doing slot level mapping, okay? So this has pros and cons if we uh, look at boost. Uh, on one side, we are more cache friendly because our elements tend to be clustered together. But on the other hand, the probability that a group is full is higher in our case because they are distributing the empty slots more uniformly, okay? So we have like this trade-off. Via some simulation program, I have calculated for the, for different load factors, three important figures. The probability that a group is full, the average prof length for successful lookup, and the average prof length for unsuccessful lookup. What I'm plotting is APL minus one because it fits nice here into the plot, but you get the idea. So as we predicted, the probability that a group is full is lower, worse, uh, sorry, higher, worse in our case because we have fewer elements per group and we have this clustering thing. This translates to the average prof length in the case of successful lookup to be slightly worse in our case. But in the case of unsuc unsuccessful lookup, the average prof length in our case is extremely better because we are using this overflow thing that discriminates among different hashes much better. So uh, if we now plot the actual number of <coughs> comparisons, okay, we see that we are slightly, uh, slightly worse for a successful lookup and we are like catching up because we are using more bits for the reduced hash thing, which means that our false positives are lower. So even though we are slightly uh, worse, we are catching up, we are almost the same. And for unsuccessful lookup, we are basically much better than those guys from AFSI. In terms of Real performance, this is a real benchmark, synthetic benchmark of uh, maps of intuits, et cetera. So you see for successful lookup, <clears throat> we are doing more or less the same and then better due to cache effects for a large number of elements. For unsuccessful lookup as predicted by our statistical analysis, we are doing much better and we are doing much better when the load factor is very high because it is our plot is less spiky, okay? And for insertion, which is very heavily dominated by unsuccessful lookup, we are also doing better. So this is Absin. You, uh, there's a guy named Martin, I have already mentioned him, Martin uh, Leitner-Anker, who maintains a very famous benchmark of a lot of different hash maps with lots of different uh, hash functions. I have selected a subset of a ROM he uh, very kindly uh, made uh, for me, where for each container I'm selecting the hash function where this container performs the best. And these are a number of different uh, test cases that uh, Martin has, uh, has devised, going from very synth synthetic or very artificial things like inserting a bunch of stuff to things a little more exotic like uh, simulating the Conway's game of life. Okay, so these are the numbers. 100 means it's best and the rest of the results are normalized to 100 column wise, okay? So are we the best? I'm not going to say we are the best. I'm not a sales person. We are among the fastest, no doubt about that. The memory is the column on the left one. Then you can consult the presentation and, and go see the, 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 <coughs> uh, the figures in detail. As expected also, stood on order map is by far the worst, but we already knew that, okay? And there's some, there are some very good containers out there. So it's not like, I mean, I'm not into a kind of competition mood or something like that. We are trying to do as best as we can, but there are some very worthy competitors out there and you should definitely check uh, as many of them as you can. So let's say I have convinced you and you want to try Boost and Auto flat map. Well, you have to have Boost, et cetera, but you also have to make some compromises or there are some trade-offs if you are migrating from Stud and Auto map, like, key and T, the, the key value and the map uh, type have uh, to be move constructible as opposed to stood and ordered map because when you are rehashing the table, you have to relocate elements from one slot array to the other one. So this comes with open nutrition. So it, it is a necessity. Again, we don't have pointer stability. If you want pointer stability, you can use boost and ordered note map, which is available like a couple of weeks ago. This is going to give you pointer stability if this is really important to you because the trade-off is that performance is better than stood on ordered map, but much worse than on ordered flat map, okay? Begin is not custom time. I don't have time to discuss this. If you are interested, I can, I can explain to you during the coffee why uh, this is so. 
Erase iterator does not return an iterator. This is for uh, performance uh, uh, reasons. The maximum load factor can be changed. This is very typical with open address and tables because you don't want the user to mess with this. Uh, this is very critical. If you uh, uh, set the maximum load factor too close to one, the thing is going to blow up, okay? And there's no bucket API, obviously. There's no scratch function, except if you're using boost or not, no BAP. And uh, well, it seems like a lot of uh, caveats, et cetera. But other than that, this is a drop-in replacement. So just basically replace the thing and enjoy. And there's a teaser, which is this boost uh, concurrent flat map. This is going to be available in August uh, 2023. Uh, it is basically concurrent flat map uh, designed to be used when you have multiple threads inserting stuff or looking up stuff, stuff into the same hash map, okay? So I won't go into details, but this is a comparison in a very silly uh, benchmark uh, test. A comparison with uh, Intel uh, TBB, and we are beating their pants off. So I'm very excited about it. Conclusions. We are providing a number of different containers from fully conformant, uh, fully standard compliant uh, uh, boost and audit map to fastest uh, boost and order, uh, asset uh, boost and audit map to fastest boost and audit flat map and node map sitting in between. You have this concurrent flat map like uh, happening real soon this year. And uh, I hope that you have understood more or less how the thing goes and why we are doing very well in terms of performance. And if you uh, give it a try, uh, take it account that there are some like uh, caveats you have to take it uh, into account if migrating from stu to node map. And go into this boost and order group in cppland.slack.com, join the conversation. We are very happy to have you uh, part of the, of the effort. And this is it. Great, thank you very much. So, time for questions. Oh. I'm not surprised. Thank you for this uh, very interesting topic and uh, good explanation. Um, the uh, I had uh, I was wondering when you were explaining about the the probing and where you do this quadratic probing. Yeah. Uh, Maybe I can go back there. Yeah. So in terms of the hardware prefetcher, you you're not helping it, right? Um, because you're not going a constant stride. So is that absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. It, is that a consideration and a benchmark you did if you if you do a constant stride instead? Yeah. The uh, thing is, okay, this is a very good question. Uh, if you're doing slab level probing, then quadratic is going to hurt you a lot because of what you say. But we are doing group level probing, and typically, even for a very heavily loaded hash table, we check one group or two, never more than that. So, so the hardware prefetcher were needed, you were in bigger problems. Yeah, exactly. All so right. we, are, we are doing quadratic probing just for the sake of it, but yes. it turns out most of the time it doesn't matter. Right, okay, that uh, also answers my second question. Um, the, the, then you showed you, you were iterating over the mask, right? After you do the comparison, you have possibly more than one answer in there. Uh, did you optimize that iteration over which indices are in there? Because I did some work over that and, and I also implemented like a, a range-based yeah. uh, loop over that and it just gives you the indices with uh, bit scan intrinsics uh, doing that. Uh, I'm, I'm using uh, intrinsics in order to, uh, so let me I'm always open to have some help from outside, but yeah, uh, that's kind uh, of why I'm asking. So, if you want. in order to get this final mask, we are yeah. doing some bit intrinsic uh, operation. Other than that, we are just like uh, consulting the next uh, set bit and then doing a mask reduction and go all the way. Right, and then do you you iterate over the fields and check yeah, whether they yeah, are true. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, exactly. so the the implementation that I did is basically you you can uh, you can turn it into a bit field. Right, and then you can a bit do a bit scan, and that mm -hmm. will give you directly the next index. Um, but uh, we can talk about that all. Yeah, sure. You have my email address, or maybe okay. we can have a talk uh, during the cafe. 
Thank you. More questions? You're probably aware that in C++ 23, we will have a flat uh, map and flat set containers, yeah. which will uh, effectively accept uh, different kind of uh, uh, template parameters. Uh, so I have a, yeah, a question whether it makes sense also to have this kind of parameters for unordered containers or not. And um, if not, whether is there, whether there can be a better name which does not contain flat there because also you mentioned in the teaser that uh, you will have concurrent flat map and this uh, completely uh, messes up uh, me. good point because I, uh, we've had internal quarrels about how to name the container and this flat thing has exactly the same uh, these kind of problems as for flat set and flat map they are basically as you know a vector with a, a into which an uh, rb3 is implemented uh, a regular uh, ordered uh, tree based structure is implemented on top of a vector okay and one of the things that stood map, uh, stood flat map does which is interesting and we are not doing is that keys and values can be uh, kept in separate arrays. We are doing. We are not doing that. So this is something that we would like to. Uh, I would like to explore. <coughs> Other than that, they are totally different lists, and uh, people are going to be uh, a little confused about the flat uh, name thing. Yeah. So sorry about that. You know, like AppSale named their container flat map. So we like uh, got a little more. Yeah. So when you mentioned concurrent flat map. Is this ordered or unordered? Is unordered. It is the same layout as the container you have already seen, but with some concurrency uh, mechanisms on top of that. More questions? Well, first, uh, first of all, uh, congrats for another container in Boost. <laughs> there is a lot of them. Uh, okay, uh, my question is related with the uh, with the concurrent uh, flat map. Just, uh, just I'm worrying, wondering about uh, the synchronization. What kind of synchronization mechanisms you have in mind uh, to develop it? Uh, or, or you don't have any one, so... No, no, yeah, yeah, we, we, we have some luck in. <laughs> it is not an absolutely luck-free thing. So the, the idea is um, uh, we have two levels of locking, one which is like container level, yeah. and the other one is group level, okay? Uh, the good thing about the layout we came up with is that open addressing has very few, very little moving parts. So it is very easy to do basically lag-free lookup, okay? And a lot, of the, a lot of the operations can be done with minimal locking, and it shows. So this is, the, this is the, the secret or the magic sauce behind this container, but we have some locking. We are using some read-write spin locks in order to do the internal locking, if you're interested in it. Okay. The, the, the code is open, by the way. You can contact me and you can have a look at it. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Very, very interesting presentation. I just, just wondering one thing about the um, uh, deletion in the. Does it hurt the performance if you get a lot of deletion? I mean, this is kind of a theoretical exercise because, but I was wondering about that. If that's a problem that you have explored. Yeah, it is a problem. Uh, if, you, uh, if you happen to have many insertions and deletions in a typical open addressing table, the average probe length is going to be increasing without bounds. Okay, what uh, some containers do, and we do that, and Epsil uh, does the same thing, is uh, we keep track of how the average probe length is increasing, and once some limit is um, reached, we rehash a table even if a maximum load factor has not been met. I call these internally drift and cheat drift mechanisms and the upsell guys like uh, call it some other thing. But if you have 
uh, if you have a non-relocating open addressing hash table, your average probe length is going to be degrading over time if you do a lot of insertions and deletions. There's no way around that. Okay, more? The, the overflow mechanism uh, that, that you've described, it requires to read two bytes. Are they always on the same cache line? It requires us to write one byte. And it is in the cache line because it sits besides the other reduced hash uh, values in the same 16 byte word. So yeah. It's, so that's it's, only on a 64 bit. Yeah, it's basically free. Thanks. More questions? Well, you probably can make more questions during the coffee break. So thank you very much for being Thank you.